Today's episode is brought to you by Idle Courses Academy. If you are looking to transition into the corporate instructional design space, you need the right guidance to do so. Dr. Sargent and her team have done an amazing job with focusing on what's important to be a corporate instructional designer, like storyboarding, ID models and theories, authoring tools, project management tactics, and more. They even cover how to make your resume and portfolio stand out from the crowd and have an impressive completion rate with their students working at organizations like Google, Salesforce, GM, Uber, Walmart, and Amazon. Also, you won't be going through this journey alone. You'll be studying alongside other aspiring instructional designers, as well as working with experienced mentors and coaches. And as an added bonus, you'll get a free copy of my ebook, What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer. So check out the industry recognized program that's showing up on more job descriptions as preferred training and education by going to idlecourses.com forward slash academy. Next enrollment is from January. 10th to January 21st. So check out Idol today. And now let's start the show. Hey folks, and welcome on in to your favorite learning nerd podcast. I'm Dr. Luke Hobson, a senior instructional designer and program manager at MIT. I also produce quite a bit of content on the internet with a blog, this podcast, and a YouTube channel all about instructional design. And I also wrote a book called What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer. My passion is online learning and instructional design, and I consider it my purpose to be able to help you with these fields. Whether you were trying to transition from one field into another, or you already are an instructional designer and you're looking to learn a little bit more about how to better your craft all are welcome into this podcast and you can find all my information over at drlukehobson.com on today's episode we have a very special guest mr peter shea I've known Pete since the before times where we actually met in person and went to these strange things called conferences. It was an odd idea where people would actually gather and share ideas about what they're working on. You know, such a fascinating idea. And maybe we'll get back to there at some point in time. But anyways, you might recall, if you've been listening to the show for a while, that I've talked about how I started this instructional design sharing journey by answering questions in a Facebook group. Every day I would log in, I would see a kind of commonly asked question, and I would answer and share my experiences about what I've done at Northeastern University and at Southern New Hampshire University. After answering the same questions every single day, I decided to make a blog and put all my experiences into one place to make it a lot easier to be able to share. All of these questions, though, if you're wondering where they came from, well, they came from Pete's Facebook group called Instructional Designers in Education. All of the credit goes back to Pete because he created this wonderful online learning community and learning environment for educators to share their knowledge and to help one another. It was Pete's encouragement that actually led to creating all of the content that you listen to and that you see today. Because you know what? That's the kind of person that Pete is. He's a wonderful human being who always encourages trying to be able to help the next up and coming wave of instructional designers. And I wanted to know more about the man who created the Facebook group in the first place. And just how does he maintain this positive online learning community of almost 14,000 people? Yes, that is 14,000 thousand members. Pete is going to take us through his origin story, where the idea came from, how the group has evolved, and lessons for you if you are interested in starting your own group. So let's dive on in, shall we? Here is the one and only Peter Shea. Pete, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Luke. It's good to be here. It sure is, sir. It's great to have you here after your long awaited debut. You should have been on the podcast. A lot sooner, if I'm being honest. But you know what? We saved you coming out here, pulling it strong for us in 2022, and you were going to lead us. So you know what? No pressure, man. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's okay. I, I combed my hair and everything. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that, yeah. Fantastic. It's a good thing that this is an audio production. So you know what? Yes. It's just going great. It's just fine. So, Pete, I like I said, been really wanting to have you come on here. And all jokes aside, you're an absolutely awesome, incredible person who very well is responsible for a part of this podcast. Because without your encouragement, 
I definitely would not be doing this as much as I would, you know, actually be doing it in real life. So this very much is your fault for why I'm talking on a microphone. So for that, I thank you. Uh, you're most welcome. I consider myself like a instructional design Johnny Appleseed. I like to spread the seeds as many places and see where they bloom. <laughs> well, well, it worked over here. So you know what? Things are going well so far. But for the folks at home who somehow don't know who you are, could you please just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about who you are and what it is that you do. Sure. Uh, I am Peter Shea. I am a, uh, by, by training, I am an instructional designer. Um, I am, I guess, the older wave of instructional designers, um, past 50. So I came of age when um, there were two ways you learned. One was on the job and then was through a, or, or perhaps through a certificate from a university or college that was trying to figure out what this instructional design stuff was and did their very best to teach you what they thought was useful. And then you went and got a job and you learned everything really useful on the job. Um, as opposed to today when we have much more sophisticated programs and um, which are often taught um, by, by my generational peers who learn the hard way what um, students should be learning and what they should not be learning. Um, so my role these days, um, I moved from full-time instructional design uh, several years ago into the world of, of academic professional development. And from that position, I began to think seriously about the professional development of my fellow instructional designers. And, and realizing how relatively isolated they are and how isol social isolation can impact um, adversely professional development. So I set about to create a uh, Facebook group specifically for instructional designers working in education because their domain is different from the one in the corporate world. And you know, I would have been happy if I got a couple of hundred people who had regular conversations. Um, but as of today, five years later, we have over 13,000 members from around the world in the group um, who have frequent lively conversations about topics related to instructional design. And I couldn't be happier about that. Because it's nuts. I still am baffled to hear that number of people because I remember when I joined, we were at, ooh, I don't know, 6,000, maybe 7,000, yeah. you know, it was around there. And then now all of a sudden, a couple of years later, and it's just absolute madness and awesomeness to see where the group has actually evolved. And I want to ask you all about that later on. But first, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I don't know, and this is why I'm asking, I don't think I've ever heard your origin story before of how you became an instructional designer. So was this something that you fell into? Was this your intent all along? How did you come over into this field? Um, like so many people, I came through it sideways. I started out on the 90s as a classroom teacher, first in K through 12, and then in higher ed. And um, as part of my master's level of work, I had a pronounced interest in educational technology. And um, my, my, first, um, my first work in projects were around um, presenting this weird thing called hypertext where you electronically clicked on something with a uh, digital document and it took you somewhere else. And I remember being fascinated by it and the possibilities. And I used to give presentations on it and I said, it's like, choose your own adventure. And I would show it to people and they'd think, wow, that's really weird and odd. Um, it seemed so strange. And then about a year later, the World Wide Web took off. Um, and that really, um, introduce people to a hypertext and the possibilities of that kind of technology. And so my interest in um, uh, technology continued in other ways. And so I got a job eventually working at a college of medicine as a coordinator of information technology. And that meant that I did a number of things. I ran their website. I ran their LMS site, which was a blackboard. Um, I edited uh, articles for them. Um, but it gave me a lot of time to play with um, various technologies for learning because I wanted to help the doctors do the very best job of presenting their complex content to their students. And so around that time, I began to see courses uh, on e-learning. We talked more about e-learning in those days than we did instructional design. And I began to sense that given my past enthusiasms, this is where um, I should probably start moving. So in 2004, I completed a uh, graduate certificate in instructional design and technology from the University of South Florida. And thereafter, I just began working in the field of instructional design, predominantly in higher education. I did a six-month tour of duty, 
at a startup and then I returned to the educational world and I've been there ever since. Um, and again, I, you know, what brought me in this was having those aha moments. There were a couple of moments when I really thought, this is great and this is what I want to do. Um, for example, uh, years ago, there was this great uh, interactive program called Frog Guts, where you did an interactive um, um, dissection. And I did it, you know, I, I had done it in school the old-fashioned way with the formaldehyde frog, and I learned nothing. But I was able to do it in the simulation on frog gets over and over, and I really remembered all the information. And I was thrilled. I hadn't felt this much fun in learning since I learned how to ride a bike. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had something like this for all forms of learning? Because then we'd actually begin to retain what we've learned rather than forget it within a week or so which was certainly my experience with many of the things that I had formerly studied. So that's when I really felt that this is where I could take my career path and where I felt I could make a, um, an interesting contribution. That is interesting. Is, is frogguts.com a thing? It used to be. I haven't checked <laughs> lately, but it was. They, it was built in Flash, and it was fast. And two science teachers um, had put it together because they realized they had saw the they saw the potential of um, some of the early web tools for, uh, for instructional media. And they realized the need, particularly for something like dissection, which can be very, very messy, um, too many kids with knives, um, uh, very expensive because you have to constantly buy uh, new frogs and new pigs and whatnot. Um, and so it was a great, great early example of the potential of well-designed um, e-learning tools and how it could do something that you couldn't do in a face-to-face -face environment. That is so, so funny. I, I was not expecting you to say say the combination of those words where I was just like, where is he going with this? I hope it's talking about dissection of, of frogs. So yes, it's frog guts, good. and it was, <laughs> and I can still I can still visualize it in my head and and the delight I took in in the virtual dissection, and I just thought it's the most must be the most awesome thing to build a tool like this, and and wouldn't it be great if we had a library of things? I would have learned so much more in school because I one of the things that I really look back on with regret is because of the really the the poor instructional design of so much of what I experienced in my schooling. Uh, I, a lot of what I studied or was required to study, I forgot. And that seems to me a terrible waste. And we we take for granted that we lose four-fifths of what we study in our school and our, our education. And I think that's that's wrong. We we now know that people can retain far more than what they we do, but that's because of the methodology. It, it's kind of like the way in which the people at the beginning of the 20th century accepted the fact that the average life expectancy was about 50 years. Um, today, that would shock us, that would scare us, but it didn't shock people or scare people then because that was the way it had always been, and they assumed that's the way it would, would always be. And I think something similar can happen with learning. We can learn more and retain far more than we ever did before, but only if we adopt the right tools and methodologies. Oh, of course, absolutely makes sense. When you were going through all of this with your your journey at the time, were there other instructional designers that you talked to and you were forming a community around to learn from one another? Or is it more kind of like of a of a solo journey as you went through everything? Well, I was able to email a few people and I certainly connected with people at my program, but I learned very quickly after I got out into the field that you're often in a solitary position. Now, if you're if you if you're over the age of 40 and you grew up in the United States, you probably will remember a commercial about a figure called the Maytag repairman. And the Maytag repairman was um, the fellow who was supposed to re to, um, to repair um, Maytag washers and dryers. And the conceit of the of the ad and it was brilliant was that they were so well designed there was never any need for the repairman. So he would sit by his desk with all his expertise um, never being used and feeling quite useless and lonely. And, you know, in my early days of instructional design, I often felt that way. I had learned all these wonderful things, but nobody was asking me about them. And, um, and I, could, I could build things, but nobody was asking me to build them. And, and I was also solitary, so I didn't have time to, to chat with other people in my field and therefore learn quickly as people do in other domains. And so that's always been in the back of my mind as I went forward. And certainly when I got around to creating the Facebook group, that was part of what I wanted to alleviate. Yeah, and it's actually a perfect segue. By the way, I actually know what, what that's from with the Maytag, with the guy being bored and his fist is on his uh, head because he's... Right, he's, right, exactly. I, I do remember that. Yeah, so even though 33 here, I uh, I can follow along with you, man. So You you, you, <laughs> you would have been the, you would have been very much at the tag end of it. It was a, it, it a decades-long commercial campaign in the United States, um, 
and I always try to contextualize it for people who didn't grow up at that at that time or in this country. But it always stuck in my mind as the model of, of what was wrong with um, instructional designers at, at that point, because um, we were solitary, and our expertise and our knowledge was was criminally underused. Oh, and I, I, I you know sure. so. Yeah, I'm sure, and I'm really thankful that now we have gotten to this this day and age where now the wisdom is actually being sought after, which is such right. a, a wonderful thing to actually be able to think about. And now, of course, this goes into your idea for creating this type of an online learning community is what I'm going to call it with the Facebook group called Instructional Designers in Education. So you had the idea, I'm guessing, early on, but then what was the actual moment where you pulled the trigger and you're like, you know what? I'm going to do this today. I'm going to make a Facebook group. I'm going to launch it and I'm, I'm going to see what happens. What was that actual spark? It was in 2017 and I had joined an existing instructional design Facebook group on, um, and I had been monitoring the conversations and I quickly realized that it was overwhelmingly focused on corporate instructional design. And I thought to myself, well, the, the instructional design world for people in education is very different. And if this group is going to focus predominantly on on corporate, then there might be a space available for someone who just wanted to focus more specifically on higher ed. Um, and rather than say instructional design in higher education, I thought, you know, it, there may become a time when uh, IDs are hard in, in K through 12. So I'm just going to say education. So I actually posted a question. Is there anyone in this group who would be interested in joining an instructional design group for people in education. And there were a number of people who said, yeah, I would. Yes, yes, yes. And so I thought, okay, there are four or five people here who seem to be interested in having higher ed focused conversations about ID. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a group. And then, and I love to curate articles. I, I, I am a, in many ways, I'm like a frustrated um, archivist. Um, so when I find things of interest, I like to share them out. That's really my major um, activity on Facebook. Um, uh, unlike other people, you probably no one would know anything about my personal life or hobbies um, from Facebook other than what I post in terms of articles that I read. Um, so uh, I just started posting, and I, you know, I, I have a pretty good eye to find content. And conversations began to generate from the first days. And again, I thought, oh, if we grow at a small pace and there's a reasonably, you know, uh, robust group of people here, then then I've succeeded. Um, and then I thought, you know, at some point it's going to like taper off, and we're going to we're going to cap at you know a couple hundred people, and and hopefully the, among those people there'll be enough people who want to have an ongoing conversation. But then this began; it continued to grow, and you know, for the most part, there was never really a time when it really just kind of went silent in terms of new members. And then, you know, certainly in the past few years, it's really accelerated, and. And, and in the past year and a half, it's accelerated, I think, largely because of COVID, because so many people um, have jumped into the online learning space. And I think particularly there are so many people in education who are in the, the classroom who don't want to leave education, but they don't want to be in the classroom anymore. And they, and they, and they want to try out this thing they call instructional design. So they're, they're, I think there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of um, refugees from the classroom who are now joining the group who want to learn about instructional design. Instructional design used to be what a colleague of mine called a hidden treasure of a job. It was a really terrific job, be quite fulfilling, but only a handful of people knew what it actually was. And I used to joke, or half joke, that I could I'd never managed to explain to my parents what it is I did. Mm, um, of course. <laughs> I, they, 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 they would always say, now what is, what is it you do again? Or, or you, you, I know you work at a college or something like that, but what do you do at the college? Um, and I would say, well, I... Oh, so you help teachers. Yeah, dad, that's what I help. I help teachers, you know. So, and in many ways, it's kind of an extension of my earlier life. I was an AV um, a kid in in, in, uh, in in high school and in college. I, I was the guy who brought in the projector and around that. So, and since my path was probably determined in some strange way early on through those activities. Um, and so that's how I find myself in this position now. Again, it's really kind of a fusion of my earlier work in instructional design um, and interesting interactive content and my interest in how people develop professionally in higher education. Um, because in higher education, you have so many people who often just stay put in one job or one organization. Professional development becomes problematic because they, they're not 
they're not always animated to learn something new because they think they're going to be doing the same job for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, whereas people in other professions will pursue professional development because they want new opportunities and new challenges. And so, you know, how do you, how do you grow within that environment? Um, and I think it's particularly important for instructional designers because we are often the people who are um, the innovation whispers in higher education. We don't often have the power to make change, but we can whisper in the ear of people who do and say, hmm, have you thought about this? And hopefully um, that will bring about change. Uh, and certainly, obviously, COVID has had um, a major impact on that um, going, you know, going forward. Oh, of course. And I think the major impact to everything is that I'm finding people now who, like you, you eventually evolved over into the role. And then for myself, I sought out to be an instructional designer early on because I worked at a university and I networked and I connected with other people all across the university. And I just so happened to become friends with a person who was called an instructional designer and I was like, wait, like, what do you do for work? And they're like, oh, I designed all the online courses that you've been helping students go through. And I was like, no way. Like, that's your job? Like, yeah, that's, that's my job is to build them. Because I always thought it was just the instructors who made them by themselves. Right. I had no idea. <laughs> I was just like, I, I don't know. Like, I just assumed that every instructor designed their course. And this was back in uh, 2013, 2014. And then after talking with him and networking of more people, I was like, Oh, I want to do this. So now in 2022, it's really cool to see that not as many people are saying like, I accidentally fell into it. They're like, no, like, this is what I want to do with my life. This is, this is what I'm passionate about. And I love seeing that within the group. Right. And, you know, I used to say, um, I used to use the metaphor that um, instructional designers are like an immigrant community. Um, we, you know, they start out. In, in, in the business world, helping people design training things. That's you know where they were for decades. And then in the 90s, with the need for a course design, they began to enter into um, higher education um, for what seemed to be um, time-limited products, helping people build online courses. And then they just kind of settled in to a higher education, but they're still treated, in, in some, well, they were used to be treated in a kind of marginal way, often like immigrant communities, because they weren't seen you know their their practices and what they did seemed strange um, uh, and not aligned with the traditional higher education model, and yet they they had become, as immigrants often do, indispensable to the running of things. Um, so that's always informed my 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 sociological perception of how IDs work in higher ed, and I hopefully you know um, I think that the last two years have, have raised our profile. Um, but I'm still cautiously concerned about you know where things are going because there are so many variables at play right now that can affect um, how the career pathway evolves in higher education. Um, so I'm I, I know where I'd, I'd like to see things go, but I'm not sure where they will go. I'm still you know waiting. Yeah, that's a good question because from my conversations with a few people, it sounds like the next steps are going to be that, you know, hey, we went into this emergency type of phase. Right. We put together the bare bones. We know as designers, it can be better, but our dean or whoever is in charge of the department or the program is like, nah, it's okay. And the instructional designers are like, no, 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 it's not okay. It, it's sufficient. <laughs> we can make it a lot better. We need to yeah. take the next step. So now it's going to be, using those human skills as far as we're convincing and getting buy-in to make people see not just the fact that it's essential, but then to take that one step further of like, no, we, we should explore this more to make it better and to make this a part of the revenue stream of the college or the university, because, you know, guess what, if you don't do this and everyone else is doing it and they're doing it well, well, we're going to be the ones to suffer and eventually close down the shop at some point in time. So yeah. that's my best guess of like where it's going to keep on going is more about this and then morphing into more of the leadership skills of the role itself, mm -hmm. which is something that always just kind of uh, frightens me that when people hear about instructional design, they only think of the tools. Right. And I was like, oh, the tools are just one tiny part of the equation. The, the people skills, the relationships, the project management, the communication, right. like that's where it is. That's the real uh, magic in everything that is that we do. So we'll that see. was that yeah. was actually my complaint about my own program when I went back to I look back on my own 
uh, preparation at the university level. I mean, we, I did have project management. I did have tools. Um, but I think the the single greatest omission curricular wise was um, the people skills uh, and having learned to negotiate with the subject matter expert or an instructor. Um, I was very fortunate because I cut my teeth working in a college of medicine. And when you're working with professors who are also medical doctors, you learn very quickly the art of effective communication versus ineffective communication. So it was a great boot camp for me. But I know that there were a lot of instructional designers who were never taught and was never emphasized in their in their in their formal training. And then when they went into the workforce, um, when they, in, in the university, um, they fumbled because they couldn't build a relationship with the instructors. I actually came to my current college because the person who preceded me um, was let go because she was not able to form productive relationships with the instructors. Um, and yeah, that's that's a really that's a, that's a major mission, and that's I'm so glad why you have something like your course on working with SMEs because you know you really have to have those skills, um, uh, and if you don't if you don't have that manner the ability to, to form the relationship, um, you're simply not going to be able to build anything productive. I mean, in the corporate world, you have a little bit more power, I think, because the subject matter expert isn't as invested in the in the online training course you're making, but in a, in a university or college. That's the whole. That's core to the instructor's identity, and they they treat it with um, great care. And you have to be very careful about helping them get to where they need to be, um, without feeling like you're impinging upon their their academic freedom or their vision. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I one colleague said it's like it's like the relationship between a surgeon and a critical care nurse. Mm -hmm. You both have your expertise. Um, the nurse obviously has to navigate the relationship with the doctor, but at the same time, the nurse has to, at, at critical moments, assert his or her expertise uh, when it comes to uh, key decision making. So, yeah, makes sense. And thank you for the um, for, for the mention about the the course. I mean, I'm glad you have uh, gone into it yourself and you and you like it as well because it's it's been really awesome to see. But to your um, point, though, too, when I first started, I started to work with engineers who were my subject matter experts. So communicating with an engineer is definitely something that you need to learn about because not every engineer is the same way as well. Right. So I had to figure that out too, which luckily helped with my communication skills very quickly and learn about all of those things. So that's, that's where to, to put a bow on that, that, that is where I think we are going to go and what people are going to eventually start talking more about, which they should, because, you know, we absolutely need to do that. And going back, because I, I want to make sure that I don't lose track of things, but going back to the community, when you first started this, did you have a goal in mind? Like, did you want so many members or posts per day or recognition or something? Was there a goal at the end of the day? I really, I, I just thought, you know, we really need to talk to one another because so many of us are isolated. Um, unless you were at a university, you were the only instructional designer. And that's a major problem in terms of your ability to thrive in a profession, um, as well as your job satisfaction. We needed a community, a practice. And I know there are a few organizations where you pay and you join and there are occasionally discussions, but they weren't big enough. They weren't vigorous enough. Um, and they were working with older models. And I hadn't seen anyone really use the, um, the social media platforms in a way that I found satisfactory to really um, create this kind of communities. Now, you can create something like this in, in LinkedIn, and I, I do have a group there, but it's smaller, and people don't spend as much time in LinkedIn. LinkedIn is more like being at the office. I remember years ago reading a book called The Third Place, um, which is about um, the importance of a, a place in a person's life that's between home and work, like a bar or a cafe or whatnot. And I realized that what instructional designers needed was their own cafe where they dropped in and talked shop with one another in a, in a non-stressful environment and just shoot the breeze and compare notes and ask each other advice and, um, and get emotional support in terms of what you're doing and, and, and share knowledge. And that's really, I, I, that's really what I wanted to do. And I think, you know, by and large group has evolved to meet that, that need and I'm, I'm really pleased to see it but that was that was really my core impetus right there I just really saw the need well congratulations because you definitely hit the goal I mean by far uh, above and beyond trying to do that and, and it is so funny too about how some of the best conversations happen when you go for 
a walk with your colleague or you go to your local watering hole or for a coffee shop, whatever it is, and you just start chatting, shooting the breeze. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you come up with some crazy, awesome idea. And you're like, and that's how I just solved my problem. It's yeah, exactly it's that talking it's, part. <laughs> it is that talking and walking. And, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, years ago looking at a, at a documentary about um, the growth of Silicon Valley and, um, and why, why the computer technology culture grew out there as opposed to where it was supposed to develop, which was Boston. It was supposed to develop in the greater Boston area around Harvard and MIT. And at least according to the, to the documentary, it was that in, in Boston, you had um, these formal old line businesses where they um, had a lot of um, restraints on what you could talk about outside of work um, and uh, agreements and so forth. And so there was there were a lot of constraints on just chatting with your colleagues, whereas in California, it was much more people get together in bar and say, hey, I'm working on, I'm on a startup, I'm working on this, oh, I'm working on that, or I have this project I'm working. And there was much more room and space and encouragement for that kind of general creative um, sharing ideas, which then in turn led to the generation of, of so much of the technology that we've seen today, um, like the home, the computer homebrew club, which led to the first Apple computer. Yeah, I mean, it makes plenty of sense to me. And I've certainly have experienced that on both sides of a coin. So like, I, I absolutely get it. And what's so impressive about the Facebook um, online learning community that, that you do have as well is just that level of engagement and everything inside of there like it just has a different vibe to it because like you I'm a, I'm a bunch of a bunch of groups on Facebook man LinkedIn and and you name it uh, I'm everywhere and you can just tell that sometimes you're in a group and there is literally no activity yeah. or it's actually meant for one person just to share and you're kind of following along in their journey and like and that's fine and well and good that has its own place in time as well but for yours, it is more of like, while you're there, and you're posting the articles, like you mentioned, and you're sharing new and relevant things in the world, you seem to kind of have more of like, taking a step back, in a way, and letting the kind of conversation um, happen organically, kind of in, in front of all of us is just my, my perception and, and being part of the group for a few years now. Uh, but in your opinion, how have you kept the group thriving with so many posts a day and seeing this level of engagement unlike ever before. I think the secret, is, well, I think a couple of things. First of all, I, I think um, I'm plugged into enough various resources to find good content. I early, In the early days, I thought this is going to go on for a little bit and then it's going to stop because one day I'm just going to, the well is going to draw. I'm not going to find anything interesting except maybe once a week. And, and then I'll, this whole this whole thing I'm doing will have run its course. And it never quite happened that way. I keep, on any given day, I think, well, I won't find it. And then three or four things will pop in front of me. And I'll think, well, this is worth sharing. Um, and I'll share it. And then I'll step back and just see what people, you know, say about it. I, I'm not interested. I'm not really interested in, in, in leading a conversation. I'm just curious and let, let it see what people think about it. Um, so it's just kind of a, I wanted to have a very light hand uh, in terms of the facilitation. And I, Occasionally, there were some times when people would say, "Well, why isn't the administrator stepping in and doing like, like you know what? I, I'm assuming everyone here is largely grown-ups. I, you know, the past years I've had very few times when I've had to actually jump in or or or, or, or offer my opinion. Um, and at some point, the, the group just took on a certain tone where you know that was needed less and less, even though it's grown to such a size because you know it was actually more combative in many ways in the early days, and I just got better at. Um, you know, facilitation and sometimes selection. And, and when people join today, I ask them, do you agree to abide by the group rules? And I've spelled it out very clearly. You have to post something that's relevant to instructional design, um, no promotions or spam, and obviously, you know, just be respectful to one another. And I've only had to deliver one message to the group saying we need to get the tone back to where it's, you know, more collegial. And that's one time in five years, which I think is, is far, far less than other Facebook groups, which can easily degenerate into, you know, and, and partly because it's instructional design, it's not politics, not something like that. You, you know, we can, when we get fury, we get things, a fury over things like learning styles. Um, and even when we disagree, I think it's a good thing because in any other mature profession, uh, people are going to disagree about things. And that's the way it should be. That's how new ideas are generated. But, you know, I think this is a pretty respectful group. Um, they're not combative, um, but they also have very strong opinions. 
And that's, I think, the sweet spot. You want have people have opinions, um, but they're not going to, you know, they're not going to hit other people over the head with their opinions. Occasionally, very rarely, you'll get someone with a trollish personality. And in that case, I've had to kick somebody out. But I've, I've had to do that on very few occasions, um, fortunately, and that which is great because that's the least happy part of being um, an online administrator. Of course. And, um, yeah. uh, but you know, and I've I've probably made a few mistakes here and there, but I've learned over time what tone to take, um, when to remain silent, and when to step in. Um, and so I've gotten, I've got a steadier hand at it now, and I, I, I want to make it look as seamless as possible. Um, so I, I prefer to be as invisible as I can be, um, and just let the content speak for itself. And kind of like the guy like at the cafe, the guy running the barista just wants to serve drinks and step back and let people talk. Um, and at some point, if they're doing their job, you become almost invisible. The atmosphere takes care of itself. Yeah, it's and it's so Im- impressive because, like you were saying, it's such a respectful group. Uh, very rarely have I same thing in the the three four years whatever it's been since I've been in the group. Very rarely have I ever seen anything that was disrespectful or people going nutty. And and I think learning styles may have been one of the topics. Usually, it's like the the random like polarizing thing on like any given day. If someone would talk about it to the general population of people, people would be like. Who cares? Why are you talking about this? But you mentioned learning styles of instructional designers and educators, and all of a sudden there's an uproar and flames and chaos, and it's like, oh, all right, I guess we're doing this, and uh, <laughs> you start yeah, talking yeah. about it. So it's the, yeah. The last ahead. thing, the last thing I said sent out that was provocative was the critique of um, universal design of learning. Um, and uh, when I posted it, uh, my my co admin Heather Dodd sent me a message saying, "Oh, well, you just lobbed a grenade into the group and just stepped back, did you?" <laughs> And, you know, I said, I, it was an interesting point of view. I just thought it was worth sharing. And uh, it's going to get, and it did get strong. Opinion, but it, and it was a, a extended post in terms of responses, but they were, and people had opinions, but it, the whole conversation was respectful. People didn't agree, but they didn't go after one another. And that was really, I thought that was a great model of what we attempted to do in the group. And by doing that too, I guarantee that while no one will ever say this to you, I am sure that as soon as you you did that and you you stepped away and the conversation happened, I bet a bunch of people went as far as we're looking into and researching best practices of UDL. Mm-hmm. Then they probably had never heard about it before and have no idea what it is. And all of a sudden now you're making a bunch of folks go out and research and try to be able to think more critically about this. So you did indeed lead to more conversations about this, I'm sure. Yeah, and that's the idea. I mean, you just want to have people a conversation space. Um, and you know, I was years ago. I was um, as part of my work. I was visiting a college in New Hampshire, and I was walking through the hallways between the classes, and they had carved out. I think it was a King State College. Um, little these um, C-shaped curves with a little bench in the middle, and it was called conversation coves. And I thought that was the cleverest thing. I thought just a place where people just stopped and just talked to one another, rather than just a bench. It was designed so they would actually face one another and just chat, mm. rather than just sit in a chair resting between classes. And I thought that's clever. I like that. I like I like good design. I mean, that's the other thing I, I like about this field is I, I really do appreciate um, the impact of effective design choices and, and the difference they can make. Absolutely, absolutely. So when everything happened with the pandemic and you went from having 6,000 to 7,000 to almost 14,000, I think. I think you're just under 14,000 now. Just under 14,000 now. Insane. What were you thinking? I was thinking, I'm, I'm really glad this is here right now because this is really needed. Um, it's almost like a public service because these people really need to be talking to one another right now more than ever because this is exactly the problem that I foresaw, which is that, I mean, I, I didn't see for, foresee a pandemic, but when you have people who become first responders, they need support from their colleagues. They need to share ideas quickly and effectively. And there was no such medium that I was aware of um, online um, for instructional designers. There was no emergency channel, so to speak, where they can communicate with one another. And I was really pleased and proud about the conversations and the sharing of resources and ideas um, and I really think that was the time when the group had its most impact, albeit invisibly, on higher education. Is because there's this back channel um, where, where instructional designers who are now the most crucial employees at their colleges were able to talk with one another. Because, again, think of all those people who, at their colleges who they were the only person on staff 
with the expertise to do this because it was colleges thought it was more cost effective to have only one instructional designer. I mean, and now, and they didn't have a support team. And I thought that was really when the, the group really came into its own and showed how, how important it could be. You know, what's absolutely fascinating, by the way, and this happened to me the other day, and I just thought about it too, is that at MIT, obviously, there are a lot of instructional designers all throughout different parts of, uh, of the Institute. And when I'm able to actually connect with somebody, it's not from being able to go and walk around campus and meet somebody in person. It's not from LinkedIn. It's primarily from your Facebook group <laughs> that someone will see me post and they're like, you work at MIT? I work at MIT. Can we chat sometime? And I'm like, right. yes, I would love to chat. But there's no other point in time where I would somehow stumble upon their office and then say like, oh, there's an instructional designer hidden in here somewhere. I'm like, yeah, let's let's actually talk more about things. And that's just so fascinating of finding your people within a larger group of people. And all of a sudden, these new connections begin to form. Right. And the other thing I'm really pleased about is the opportunity to make people aware of job opportunities. Um, because I, uh, in the early days, it was hard to find um, good job opportunities. Um, I mean, in the earliest part of my career, in the early 90s, we were still using newspapers to find jobs. And so it was impossible to find a good job unless you, you knew somebody. And then the web became a means of sharing information about jobs. And in fact, when I was in graduate school, one of the ways in which I... Um, I vital, revitalized the uh, the listserv we had for instructional des design students was to simply start posting jobs I found on the web. And that's when the list became, that listserv became active because all of a sudden people realized it was a place where they could see jobs being posted. And so whenever I see a job opening somewhere, I think this is a great opportunity because the other thing that can really stymie um, an instructional designer's development, and this is very true of higher education, is that people get stuck in one place in one job and, and, and their skill set um, stagnates because they're not being asked to do anything interesting or in a new environment. And so I, you know, I like to make people aware that, you know, they, there are, there are a lot of jobs emerging in this field in higher education um, and they should, they should move around and see the opportunities and compare salaries and compare and ask people, have you worked here? What's it like? Because the more movement there is, the more expertise will grow. And the more expertise will lead to more interesting forms of instructional design. Whereas if we stay in one place for too long, um, we won't grow. And that's always been my own concern. I I, I look at Envy at, at, at some of our colleagues um, who have been able to work in a variety of places and on a variety of projects that I think, oh, I, I really would have liked to have been able to do that myself. Um, but instead, I, I went from basic instructional design into a kind of a managerial role. But I've always yearned to just do pure instructional design all the time. But at this point in my career, that's probably not going to happen. So I try to encourage younger instructional designers to take advantage of as many opportunities um, for growth and development as they can and opportunities that I, I did not have. And I used to say that if I ever um, started in a professional development consulting firm, I would call it Marley's after Marley's ghost in um, the Christmas Carol where Marley comes back to Scrooge and says, it's too late for me, but I can give you information that will make it better for you. Um, and so that's one of the things I could do is, is try to help people have more interesting and varied careers than the one that I was able to have. Um, because I think the potential is, 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 tr is tremendous there, um, particularly in, in large urban areas where there are a number of colleges and where people are still at a point where they feel comfortable moving around and trying new roles um because if they do that they'll be i think they'll be more satisfied and like i said before um they'll have an opportunity to develop greater um uh, forms of expertise of course and the group and everything that you mentioned about the job postings too one of the things that's so special about that compared to trying to use a, a job searching platform like indeed or ZipRecruiter or whatever, there's a whole bunch of them out there, is the fact that usually the person who is posting the job, it's on their team. And you can message them and talk with them and ask yeah. like, what's it like? Tell me about the culture. How is leadership? What yes. What is it like for you having your say within the group? And what are you actually working on? Are you excited about it? And, and all these different questions. And that is so rare. It's so rare to be able to have that unless you go and intentionally find the person on LinkedIn 
or you're connected already. But other than that, it's like the person's literally in the group. And I've seen it now happen many, many, many times that you'll post the job posting and then somebody who works there will comment on it. And they'll say the same thing. Like, we're totally open, able to answer any questions that you might have. Feel free to message me for any details. I'll answer what I can. You know, right, you're right. Because that's the that, that is the the classic omission of any job posting is you never know what's behind the scenes. I mean, they all look really nice and it sounds really cool, um, and but you don't know what the reality is organizational wise. And we've all known people who've made a jump into a job and discovered that it was not the place they thought it was, and um, it's not as easy to jump out again. Um, and so, you know, it's always, I, I always feel more comfortable myself to be able to ask, you know, what's the culture like? And I've gotten back some wonderfully candid answers where they say, well, this is the good part and this is the bad part. Yes. You know, and if you know that, then you're much more comfortable putting your name in. And um, the other thing, too, is when people, you know, because obviously uh, you know, there, there are so many people in the field, people apply for a job that they're qualified for and they don't get it and they feel bad and say, well, did I, did I do anything better? And it's like, no, 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 you did go well. But if you want to, you know, stand out here, a few things to keep in mind. So it's encouraging for people too, because again, um, the, the secret's out of the bag. There was a time when um, their uh, instructional design was relatively a mystery. And so there was less competition and now there's much more competition. So how do you stand out? So that, to me, it's one of the more interesting conversations about how do you stand out these days as an instructional designer, particularly when the people who are doing the instructional design hiring themselves do not understand what makes an exceptional instructional designer. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's not a fascinating part about the field, by the way, is that it's trying to be able to make sure that people are calm, cool, and collected if they do get a denial or, you know, they unfortunately hear negative feedback right away and then it's just like well the, the first thing is first is that the person doing the phone screening by the way isn't the hiring manager it's a recruiter who is given a piece of paper to say here's what you're looking for these are the keywords these are the qualifications if they meet these and they seem like a normal good human being let's pass them on to the next round Right. And unfortunately, some people are like, oh, my gosh, I talked about this and this and this, but they didn't seem to acknowledge it or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, but they're not the ones you want to be able to impress and dazzle with all of your awesomeness. Like they're they're there for the gatekeeping <laughs> but you need to work through. And then eventually you talk to more of the people who have a better sense about instructional design. But even then, even then, the person who could be hiring for the position on the team could be somebody who needs an instructional designer, but they themselves have never done instructional design. Right. Right. So then it becomes a whole, yeah. So that's why going back to your point, getting that insider information is just so crucial because that way you're going to know and you're going to learn and you can reflect upon that feedback and try to do better the next time and to keep on going. So no, yeah. it, so it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and like we were saying, we, we keep seeing these um, postings and so many postings are happening like every single day. Uh, I'm realizing that if I'm in the Facebook group and I look at something, if I refresh just like 30 seconds later, a new posting will happen. Like it's it's that rapid fire of engagement yeah. at some times and some days. And it's just crazy. Did it ever occur to you that this could become your full time job if you let it? Well, there are days when it does feel like my full time job, um, <laughs> uh, but it's it's not you know like unlike other forms of social media, um, it doesn't lend itself easily to becoming a, a revenue generating uh, model like a YouTube video. And in fact, you know, a friend of mine said to me, you know, you've got this huge group. Do you do you to get paid to do it? I said, no, I don't, I don't. And so he consulted his son. You know, a generation. He said, well, "Well, what should he do?" He says, "Well, does the guy create any original content? That's how people monetize their." And I said, "No, I just curate. I just curate and I and I monitor. That's it's not an easy way to. I don't do anything on on YouTube or anything like that. Um, uh, either I'm I'm too lazy or I don't have enough time. Um, but you know, I you know, I would love to, to be able to do something like this full time. But the fact that I can do it part of the time." Um, I find gratifying um, because I, there are times when um, I really want to feel like I'm making a contribution somewhere to something. And when I post something and people respond to it or, hey, I was looking for that, that that can be quite gratifying. Um, and, you know, again, it's, 
it's one of those things that you know you know if i had more business sense i probably would have found a way to make a living doing it um but if i had more business sense i probably wouldn't have pursued a career in higher education um so you know it, you, you take it as it is if if there's a if there would be a way to do that that'd be great if not i'll, I'll still continue doing it because I, I like the i like the social value that it creates and i like the community that it creates and i think this is a super important field um you know, anyone who knows me will know that I, I will, at the drop of a dime, go on a tear about how poorly we, we design learning experiences in spite of all that we now know about what works and what doesn't work. Um, so I think learning design um, is, is an incredibly crucial and unappreciated field. And I think going forward that um, organizations that begin to utilize its insights wisely will create learning experiences that are superior to the ones that are being offered by the more conventional learning organizations in colleges and schools. And sooner or later, people will begin to migrate to them. And, you know, um, the more traditional uh, institutions will begin to feel the pinch, which they should, because they've been operating from the same uh, essentially medieval model for a very long time. We, we, we confuse information sharing with learning. And, you know, we, we know that we can do a much better job. I mean, if you've ever had an instructional design experience that was really impactful, um, you know what the good stuff looks like. Um, it's like people who, you know, spent their whole lives drinking, you know, instant coffee, and then all of a sudden they walked into a, 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 a Starbucks and they had a strong cup of coffee, and they, for the first time they realized, well, this is what coffee is supposed to taste like. I think the same thing is with instructional experiences. And I think and the one thing that, that worries me is is uh, going back to what I said about this stagnation is that there's a lot of talented people in the field of instructional design who are not being given projects that really optimize their creative ability. And that worries me. And I certainly found in my own experiences that I wound up doing independent projects largely to help satiate my creative side because my day jobs were not asking me to do anything that really drew fully upon my abilities and so that's one thing i try to encourage people to do is think about rather than wait for the for the dream product to occur build something if nothing else it will help you keep your sanity and keep your skills fresh because again you don't want to be an instructional designer caught in a dead-end job the job you want really comes along but you can't make the jump because your current job has not pushed you enough. Um, we can't wait for the institutions to do that because they're very conservative pedagogically. So we have to figure out creative ways to keep our portfolios and our skills fresh so that when that job that really fulfills us comes along, we're ready for it. I love it. You're preaching the truth, man, because this is why I'm you know, talking to you on a podcast and sh sharing blogs and other things because uh -huh. I'm with you. I'm yeah. hundred percent all aboard that life. And and I've known some people too, that they only wanted to be in the instructional design type of role. And, and that's what they wanted. And they were happy with that. And they did that for, for 20, 30 years. And it's like, okay, you have meaning in this work. You are happy. Life is good. But I know of a lot of people where they're like, well, what's next? Like they're already thinking about the next move. It's only been, yeah. you know, three years in the field or five or, you know, even just like one year. And they're like, okay, so what am I doing now? <laughs> how, do, how do I get better? How can I become more engaged? What can I really do? And trying to be able to think about that for those next steps and planning ahead and just getting better professionally and, and not being bored, you know, just the, right. that, that nine to five grind will eat away at you. If you don't have something that you find exciting at the end of the day, like you, you need it. You, you do, you do. And clearly, you know, this is your passion project. This is everything that you've been doing and you've been spreading the good word about instructional design for so long. So I know that, that we can't thank you enough. If there was somebody out there who's listening right now, and let's say that they want to start their own type of online learning community, but they want it to be like yours with engaging and posts and conversations and everything else, even if it's not an instructional design, it's just entirely in a different field, what advice would you give them for trying to be able to replicate your steps and your success? I would just say, um, you know, for is, 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 number one, is something you really care about, and you really and you and you will be yourself consistently interested in it. Number two, is there um, is there an absence of good avenues of conversation in your field? Um, 
because if, if there is a community that already exists, it's going to be hard to attract people away from it. In this case, there wasn't a community. There was really no competition um, for that. And the other thing is find a way to, 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 to routinely locate or create good content to keep people interested because most of the people in the community are going to be lurkers. They're not going to contribute um, to the conversation all the time and they're not going to post things, but they're going to stick around because they're curious to see what you have to offer. So you have to have some sort of routine um, output strategy for having a content output. Um, and in my case, it, it was curation. Um, and so those were the factors that I think led to, to my success. Um, and again, if you know, if you are passionate about something and you think there aren't existing avenues to, for people to explore conversationally wise, then, um, then I said, give it a try. Certainly give it a try. Absolutely. And I hope people listen to your words and follow through on that because as we've been talking about all along, the the group is unlike anything else I've ever experienced before. I've been a part of many, many different Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups, and not just for instructional design, you name it, anything for fitness to cooking to podcasting to, you know, whatever. And you have something special. Like you, you really, really have something special in here. What do you think is next for the group, by the way? If you can wave a magic wand or take, take out your crystal ball and try to think about the future. What do you think is next? I, I, I think I'd like, um, you know, I'm hoping to do, I, I would encourage you to do more live um, presentations in the group the way other people do it on, on Facebook groups um, and encourage people to come in. And I'm certainly toying with that idea now. Um, but I want to do something that's um, distinctive as well. Um, because there are certain things that I'd like to nudge um, for instructional design, um, certain ideas I want to get across. I, I've always liked the idea that if the right tool came around, instructional designers could begin to create a library of artifacts, open, openly shared artifacts, which they could contribute to, and which would um, feed their creativity and enable them to, to really show the world what an um, interestingly designed learning artifact is. Um, you know, you and I were talking earlier about Authorware, which was a tool they used um, back in the 90s to create interactive learning experiences that you could do so without having a, an advanced programming um, skills. And I've, I've always wished that we had some sort of equivalent tool um, that people could widely use to create interesting artifacts. Because, again, we have a lot of books on how to draw, but we don't have enough interesting paintings. And that's what we really need. We need to get people you know, the instructional design equivalent of painting and sharing their work with one another, because that's where the field can go next. But it won't go there unless certain conditions can occur. So you know, I'm thinking if we can get people to start share, creating more interesting work and sharing it out, I, that would be great. Because I really think whenever I come across a really interesting learning artifact that, that really grips me, I, I really want to share it with people and say, isn't this awesome? Isn't this great? It wouldn't be great to have something like this for all these other topics. And then that animates people to, to go out and, and build them. I love it. I love it. Let's go out on that note. Pete, if people want to go to be able to connect with you and to find you, I mean, obviously they can find you on the, the uh, Facebook group, but is there anywhere else that they should go to connect with you online? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, like uh, me and a million other Peter Shays. In fact, there's another, there's a, there's a, doc, there's a Dr. Peter Shea uh, in, in educational technology out of the University of Albany, um, where people have occasionally confused me with him. Um, I always say I'm his evil twin. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, I'm, I'm, I, I can be found on, on, on LinkedIn and I've, I, you know, I've shared it out with people who are curious to connect with me and I'm always open as long as they're not trying to sell me anything. I, I'm usually open to connecting with people via LinkedIn and, and, and chatting with them. So, you know, fantastic. Well, I'll be sure to link that into the show notes so everybody can go and find you and connect with you on both Facebook and LinkedIn. But Pete, once again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Luke. It's always fun to chat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you liked today's show and learned a bit about online learning communities. If you like the dynamics and the chemistry between Peter and I, we do have a YouTube presentation that we did together on 10 futuristic ideas for online learning that we did over for EduFlow. And you can actually find a link to this video in the show notes, or if you just simply go onto YouTube and search Peter Shea and Luke Hobson, it's the first video that actually pops up. 
And we're currently thinking about this, kind of like a new idea, a sneak peek of what we're trying to come up with together about actually making a course on these types of 10 futuristic ideas and trying to put together for you real actionable steps for you to take to make these new types of online learning ideas come to life for the present day. That's kind of like the bit about everything with the uh, top 10 presentation of the online futuristic ideas is that many of these ideas are really here today and people are doing it right here and right now, but they're not getting as much publicity as you think. So we are trying to shine the light on many different types of new ideas and innovations that are currently in place, but they're not mainstream yet. So we're thinking about making a course to put those all together in order to help you along your instructional design journey. If you haven't yet already, you should obviously join Pete's Facebook group, Instructional Designers in Education. I'll put the link to the show notes down below as well. And obviously, you can go into Facebook and search for the group, type in the name, and it's going to pop right up. But that, ladies and gentlemen, that is all I have for you today. Hope you like this podcast episode. Give it a five-star rating wherever you are listening. And most importantly, stay nerdy out there. And I'll talk to you next time.